Okay, so my name is Colleen Campbell and I'm the Assistant Director of the Iowa Institute of Human Genetics at the University of Iowa and the Carver College of Medicine. And I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak today. And I also want to let those of you in the audience know that um, please go ahead and submit questions throughout the talk and then I will answer those at the end and just submit them as they come to mind. So the title of my talk is The Role of Genetic Counselors in the Implementation of Personalized Genomic Medicine. And in order to talk to you about the role of counselors, I'm first going to describe where we're at right now with the implementation of personalized genomic medicine at the University of Iowa, which is a tertiary care center and the major hospital for the entire state. So just so we're on, on the same page, I think most of you in the audience will be familiar with personalized genomic medicine, but it is a way to improve your health using your family history, medical history, genetic information, and lifestyle. And you really use genetic information to make precision me medicine possible so that your healthcare provider can personalize your medical management and treatment to optimize your health. We say that there's four Ps of personalized genomic medicine. It's personalized, so the risks are unique to you. Even if you have a twin, as many of you in the audience know, that there's still uh, epigenetic changes and other changes that make this really unique to every individual. It's predictive, so if we, we can start to predict now that you may be at risk for developing a specific disorder in the future. And it can be preventative, so if we know that you're at risk for developing a specific disorder, there may be exposures and behaviors that you can modify um, as well as some screening t that you can implement so that you can uh, delay the onset or prevent the disease. And finally, personalized genomic medicine is participatory. It requires the individual's participation. Nobody can do this um, for you. You have to be involved the, as a patient. So an example of where personalized genomic medicine is successful is in age-related macular degeneration, which is an adult onset form of blindness affecting one-third of adults over the age of 75. We know that variants in the complement factor H gene uh, predispose individuals for developing AMD, and what you're seeing in the image there is a buildup of drusen in the back of the eye. Uh, next to the image of the eye, there's two pictures, and most of you are probably seeing the faces of two little boys, each holding a ball. And that's what you would see if your eyes are healthy. Now, somebody with AMD would not see the boys' faces, and as you can see, there's a blurred out center of this image. What we know is that individuals who have specific variants in complement factor H, if they exercise, eat a low-fat diet, wear sunglasses, and eat plenty of fruits and nuts, they can prevent the symptoms and um, delay the onset of this disorder. So the Iowa Institute of Human Genetics is a new institute. We were approved by the State of Iowa Board of Regents in August of 2012. And it was brought about to promote the clinical care research and education focused on medical and scientific significance of variation in the human genome. And this is based off of things like the complement factor H, where these discoveries are really being translated now um, into a clinical setting. And what the institute was charged with doing was developing new tests at the request of clinicians across the state of Iowa, as well as to provide statewide outreach on issues related to the understanding and extent of the meaning of the human DNA sequence variation. And in order to do this, we know that, and we all hope that uh, genomic medicine will be here for a long time, and so we're going to need more individuals working on these teams. And so we also were charged with capturing the imaginations of the next generation of students at the pre-professional level and really educating all Iowans about personalized genomic medicine because they can either be part of the team or they will have this uh, as part of their health care sometime in their lifetime. So the institute has four divisions and four supporting pillars, and these four pillars are really involved with everything we do. So our research at the institute is translational, so we're really developing new clinical tests. Um, obviously, then the clinical tests, we support the clinicians here in the state and beyond, as well as the researchers. Innovation, we are always looking for ways to develop new tests, um, new technologies, whether it's from the wet bench through to the bioinformatics, as well as new ways to educate not only students but also healthcare providers about genomic medicine. 
And really to implement this, you cannot do it without educating everybody involved. Um, and so education is a huge portion of what we do here at the Institute. So our first test that we uh, took on, our first initiative, was for pharmacogenomics. And right now, on average, any given medication on the market only works in half the individuals taking it. And what we know is that genetic variation can influence an individual's drug response, and that by testing these genetic variants, we can help healthcare providers uh, decide which is the best treatment for their patients. And this might be by changing the dose requirement or prescribing an alternative drug. And all of this is to reduce the risk of experiencing drug side effects. So the drug we chose to start with is clopidogrel or Plavix. Many of you have probably heard commercials about uh, this drug on TV. And Plavix is taken by millions of Americans as a blood thinner to help prevent heart attack and stroke. We know that 30% of people are resistant to clopidogrel, meaning that their body is not processing this drug properly and they're still at risk for heart attack and stroke. We also know that variants in the gene CYP2C19 affect how patients respond to clopidogrel. So last October, we launched our first test for clopidogrel response or, for, or CYP2C19. Any healthcare provider in the country can order this test um, online and they would receive a report with educational material um, built into that report. We also built the test into our local electronic medical record system. Here at Iowa, we use EPIC. And so for in healthcare providers in at the University of Iowa, they can order the test through the EMR EPIC. And this is just a screenshot of what it would look like if you went to our website. It's really an integrated platform that was the result of a really large multidisciplinary collaboration. And we chose one gene um, and one drug and started small. And we actually only started in the division of cardiology where we collect DNA from patient sam saliva samples. Those samples then are transported to the lab where they undergo genotype analysis. And really because we knew that this was going to take a large effort to get every other aspect of the test implemented, we kept the lab part really simple. And so we only looked at four variants in, a, in CYP2C19 by TACMAN assay. We're working on expanding this uh, platform as we speak, and we'll be launching a, a new platform uh, here within the next year. Like I mentioned, we integrated this test into our electronic medical record system, EPIC. And so we have it integrated in in a couple of levels. There's a series of best practice alerts. The first alert is to notify healthcare providers that they may want to order this test on a patient who may have this medication prescribed. So if somebody is having, for example, an elective stint and would be put on Plavix or Clopidogrel after the stint, an alert would come up and notify the healthcare provider that they may want to order the test. The test is then ordered through EPIC, and the results are reported back to EPIC, both as raw data results, the genotypes, and um, also a PDF of the physician report. Then there's a series of alerts in place for um, patients who are poor metabolizers and would not respond to uh, clopidogrel, where the physician, it would notify the physician that this patient will not respond to uh, Plavix or clopidogrel, and they may want to prescribe uh, an alternative medication. There's links through those uh, re results as well as the BPAs to healthcare provider education on our website. We have, for patient education, we have a website that's been plain language approved, and it's a brochure that patients can get before, and we're working on building up online education modules for patients as well. For physicians, we have online um, education modules, including a video explaining the tests and how to understand it. And we will be continuing to expand these education modules as we develop our new test. Next, I'm gonna talk about our second test. It's very similar in a lot of aspects, but there are some differences, and that was clinical exome sequencing. So we developed a clinical whole exome sequencing test, which is now available and any can be ordered by any healthcare provider in the United States. The test was really developed out of a large collaboration, again, um, that was the result of the Clarity Challenge. And so the University of Iowa um, sponsored a team in the Clarity Challenge, and we had over 40 individuals from seven different colleges, as well as the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics participate on this team. 
that really built the pipeline for the clinical exome test. We also spent a lot of time talking to physicians and genetic counselors here at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics who all were in agreement that they wanted a useful tool. They weren't comfortable with secondary findings at the time, and for several reasons, secondary findings are not reported back on our test. We also spoke to other institutions offering the test and asked them for their advice and lessons learned um, that they had before we launched our test. This test um, is pretty standard uh, compared to the other exome tests. It's a tool that can be used to narrow the differential diagnosis for patients with undiagnosed genetic disorders. These patients might be diagnostic odyssey patients or patients with a long list of differential diagnoses where sequential testing would be cost prohibitive and also patients with atypical presentation of the disease. We prefer that there's family trios, and so um, this is two parents and an affected child, but we'll accept single patients if the parents are not available. And this test can be ordered online through um, our website as well. Um, just real briefly to mention about consenting. So here at the Iowa Institute of Human Genetics, we have two umbrella consents. These are developed for all types of genetic testing. Uh, the research consent is used while we're developing a new test, and the clinical test is then used once the test has been launched. The clinical consent can be used for any type of genetic testing, so genotyping through whole genome sequencing, but we only currently use this consent for whole exome sequencing. The turnaround time is 11 to 12 weeks. A lot of this time is spent on the actual processing of the DNA and sequencing of the DNA, as well as the data analysis and interpretation. Because we need to support both researchers and clinicians here at the University of Iowa, we have two or more of every machine that is used in this process, so that in both pipelines are clinically validated, so there's not a backup at any time if there's a, a machine goes down or if there's a lot of samples that are being run through on clinical demand or research demand. The cost of the test is $4,000 for a single patient or $5,500 for a parent-child trio. And genetic counseling is available if a physician does not have a genetic counselor um, available to use in counseling the patient but would like the patient to receive counseling, uh, we can provide that genetic counseling through the institute and there would be a separate counseling fee um, billed. We currently provide um, institutional billing, but we're working on expanding the different billing options available. This is really the heart of any kind of genetic testing is this integrated team-based approach. And so it begins with the wet lab and starting with the DNA extraction from the sample and then performing the capture. And then it goes on to the sequencing and then the informatics. So our exome test is a symptom-guided analysis test. And so this means that actually prior to any sequencing taking place, a group, a multidisciplinary team actually goes over the differential diagnosis and comes up with a symptom-guided gene list. And that list is then used for the analysis and all other results are blinded so that secondary findings are not an issue. The physician also has a say in that gene list in that on the clinical history form, they can provide a list of genes that they are interested in in particular. Once the initial symptom-guided analysis is done, um, then it goes to the multidisciplinary team meeting. And this is really the most important part of the entire process. This meeting consists of researchers, um, clinicians, genetic counselor, bioinformaticians, systems administrators, lots of individuals who come together. And they discuss the variants in the context of the patients um, that are being tested. And so this is talking about their phenotype and modes of inheritance. We look at ACMG variant pathogenicity criteria, and then we determine which are the plausible variants that would move on for confirmation. So any variants we decide that look like they're the disease-causing variants then go through a second confirmation. Um, this is Sanger sequence uh, confirmation or, an, or an alternative technology depending on the type of variant. And this is done to ensure there's not a sample mix-up, to check for segregation as well, and um, to confirm that the results are actually real. Um, 
And when we have our multidisciplinary team meeting, one of the other features that we've added is to invite the ordering healthcare provider to that meeting. This is both as a mode of educating the healthcare providers and genetic counselors as to how do we narrow down all of these thousands of variants to our actual disease causing variant, as well as to get their expertise both in the disease and in their patient. And if the healthcare provider is local, this is done, the meeting is scheduled so they can attend. If the healthcare provider is not local, then we will do this over GoToMeeting or a Skype-like conference. Um, to implement exome testing and pharmacogenetics testing, we've had to develop a lot of healthcare provider education. And this is really not just for physicians, but for anybody who comes into contact with the patient, so nurses um, or anyone on that healthcare team. We are currently about to launch um, a series of educational modules on our website to educate the providers about the tests and from everything on when it's appropriate to order to how to interpret the report. We're also launching a series of departmental grand rounds of, regarding exome sequencing. We have a genome resource center, our hotline, and this is where physicians who are considering ordering the test can call us and we can help them with either determining if the test is appropriate to order through to understanding the report. We're also developing a workshop for genetic counselors regarding whole exome sequencing so that they're more comfortable with this test in particular. Another program we have for healthcare providers is our Clinician Identified Exome Analysis for Rare Disease Program, and we call this the EARD program. And it's to educate Iowa clinicians about exome sequencing. And we're really here targeting not geneticists, but those non-genetics um, healthcare providers. We've completed three of these applications to date, and we've just uh, announced our second round of awardees. And what happens in this program is the clinician identifies a family that they think would be good for exome testing. And they complete a brief online application, and then they come and give a brief presentation to the selection committee. And we talk to them about if this is an appropriate family for whole exome sequencing and possible modes of analysis. The institute then performs all of the sequencing, and we pay for all of the sequencing, as well as the initial informatics. Um, analyses, and then we bring the provider back in and we explain what was done, and we also go through the interpreting and filtering of the data with the provider. Because these are not uh, non-geneticists, we wrote a guide for uh, the be beginner's guide, let's say, about interpreting and filtering exome sequencing that we give these clinicians. And when they're done with the program, the, what they have to give in return for us doing the sequencing is a departmental grand rounds. This grand rounds has to be a normal case uh, report where exome sequencing isn't the focus, but it's used as a tool in order to help solve what's going on with their patient. And what's been really amazing to watch with this program is these non-genetics professionals have come in knowing very little about exome sequencing. They've heard about it at a conference and wanted to learn more, but they really don't know the terminology or anything like that. And by the time they give their grand rounds, they can explain a filtering strategy just as well as any geneticist. And so really what we're trying to do here is create some champions within their home departments that can be a resource for other healthcare providers who are interested in exome sequencing. Another um, way we're trying to educate our healthcare providers is we're developing a workshop for personalized genomic medicine for all healthcare providers in the state. Uh, this will not be focused strictly on exome sequencing, but will be uh, cover lots of different aspects of personalized genomic medicine, starting with the foundation and the principles of basic genetics through the application. For patients, we currently have a series of plain language approved uh, patient brochures that can be used uh, to help educate the patient about various aspects of testing. Um, we also are in the process of developing a statewide education campaign and online education modules for patients as well. Well, moving on for more education, um, like I mentioned, the Institute was really charged with educating and empowering all Iowans about personalized genomic medicine, and this ranges from kindergarten through retired healthcare providers. And this was because everybody could be a patient. This hopefully will be utilized during their lifetime. And it's also an investment in our future. We have a series of educational activities that have been developed, and I'm not going to go into detail on any one of these, but I'm happy to answer questions or talk about any of them further. 
Our first is a quarterly event called Careers in Human Genetics Day, and this is where college and high school students from around the state come in and they hear from all of the members of the health of our personalized genomic medicine team. A spin-off event that was at the request of the students was a career event on bioinformatics and big data, as well as a second event on applying for genetic counseling graduate programs. We routinely perform educational outreach at colleges and high schools around the state, and we also have developed a genetic counseling summer internship program. At the University of Iowa, currently there's not a genetic counseling training program, but there's high interest in, in recruiting more counselors to the state. And so the internship program is for students who are interested in becoming genetic counselors. And this has been uh, a very popular program as well. We have a topics in human genetics summer course for uh, graduate students and medical students. And then a couple different seminar series, one for the general public, as well as uh, seminars for our healthcare providers and researchers here on campus. And then we have web resources, and we also have next generation sequencing and bioinformatics user group monthly conferences for education of our local researchers. Some of the resources we've provided, we try to keep a lot of these on our website. We have a calendar of genetic events that are happening in the region, a glossary that's really plain language so anybody can understand it. And Ask the Expert feature, which is on our website, this has become a really popular um, tool, and it can be used by students, uh, the general public, or researchers or clinicians. This is where the, somebody can submit a question to the institute. These are triaged by a genetic counselor, and then go on, some of the questions go on to the entire group, which includes researchers, clinicians, counselors, and bioinformaticians. So we can best answer that question and then return um, the answer to the uh, person with the inquiry. Like I mentioned before, we wrote a how-to filter guide for researchers. We also have a manual um, or a brochure packet on careers in human genetics that we give students attending our events, and then the patient education brochures. So the title of the talk was, What is the Role of Genetic Counselors? And now that you understand a little bit of what it takes and some of the ways we're implementing personalized genomic medicine, I'll speak more about the actual role of the genetic counselor. So just so we're all on the same page, the goal of genetic counseling is really to help patients learn more about the causes of genetic conditions and how those conditions affect them. Genetic counselors um, receive specialized training in medical genetics and genetic counseling. This is a two-year master's training program. The programs um, need to be American Board of Genetic Counseling, or ABGC certified, and then after graduation, the counselors take a board exam. So if you see CGC behind a counselor's name, that means they're a board certified genetic counselor. Most counselors, although we're trained in all aspects of genetics, most counselors will subspecialize into cancer, prenatal, pediatric, neurogenetics, or even just a, a subset of diseases like hearing loss. The counselors are part of the healthcare team, and what they do is to communicate the scientific information in plain language to patients, provide risk assessment, education, and then support to the patients and families. Because genetic counseling is a relatively new field, it was actually started in 1969, there's a lot of healthcare providers who don't know and actually want to learn more about how do they work with genetic counselors as part of the team. And so a program that we're piloting here at the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics, the Holden Compre Comprehensive Cancer Center, is a seminar series on working with a genetic counselor as part of the healthcare team. There will be three speakers, one genetic counselor and two physicians. And actually, the physicians volunteered to do this based on their experiences at other institutions with genetic counseling training programs. And they felt it was very important for physicians to understand how to work with genetic counselors. The topics that will be covered will include what is a genetic counselor, the roles of genetic counselors, when to refer, and how the genetic counselor can really enhance your practice and patient satisfaction. And these will be an interactive uh, series of seminars with an audience response system as well. So how do genetic counselors help with the implementation? It, there's a lot of different ways where genetic counselors can actually become involved. And the first is obviously patient education. So informing patients about benefits, risks, and possible outcomes of genomic testing, as well as how to understand the results of this genomic testing. Counselors are also poised to be key players in educating other professionals based on their experience with translating this complex genetic information into terms people can understand. 
And so really um, in integrating genomic medicine into these non-genetic specialties to improve patient care. Um, genetic counselors also can play a really active role in the data analysis, integration, and interpretation. All genetic counselors are trained in all aspects of diseases. So with tests like the exome testing, they really have can bring um, another at per, per point of view to the table when coming up with that symptom-guided gene list, as well as the interpretation and writing of the reports. Counselors are also actively involved in research to help continue the, to develop this field. Um, an area that I think that genetic counselors will become more involved with, and I challenge them to become more involved with, is really taking an active role in developing new technologies. And so right now in the United States, there's not an electronic medical record system that really integrates genetics throughout the entire system. And when we're talking about genetics here, this isn't just the genetic results, but also things like your family history, which play a huge component of your genetic uh, information. And so genetic counselors routinely take family histories and are used to looking at the clinical histories to counsel their patients better. And so genetic counselors um, should play an active role in this integration of genetics into the EMR as well as into their hospitals. They also um, can help develop reports that are easier to understand for this just-in-time learning for healthcare providers who are not familiar with genetics, but how do they learn while they're getting back these results. And so these reports really should be educational tools as well. And then genetic counselors also can be involved with the developing of clinical and research-informed consent protocols. And here you have to note that not all genetic testing requires informed consent. For example, pharmacogenetics testing does not require informed consent, but more complex tests like a whole exome or whole genome sequencing typically will require informed consent. Counselors are also poised to have an active role in promoting public awareness and engagement in genomics and really developing some of this outreach activities. And then finally, you know, engaging that next generation of students and really getting them excited about this so that they want to come and join this uh, personalized genomic medicine team, whether it's as a genetic counselor or another type of uh, team member as well. So why are counselors, you know, poised for this implementation? Speaking, they work, um, they're trained to speak in plain language and really actively engage patients, the general public, students, the healthcare team, but also, you know, the regulatory funding and legislative organizations. So here at the University of Iowa, we have strong support from our highest levels of administration because we've talked with them and about personalized genomic medicine, and they really understand the need um, to integrate this into the entire healthcare system here in the state of Iowa. And so working with those, um, your administrators at a local level, as well as your regulatory and funding bodies who can help develop new um, guidelines for reimbursement of genomic testing and genetic counseling in general. Um, counselors routinely teach. That's what we're doing with patients when we explain to them about genetic conditions. But they also need to be teaching in their training programs to really educate that next generation of genetic counselors. And so, like I mentioned earlier, here in the state of Iowa, we um, have a small number of genetic counselors that we're really actively uh, trying to grow so that this can be a reality and explaining all this information to patients. Finally, um, by writing, again, we have to write these reports so any healthcare provider could pick it up and understand what a genomic result is. And so this really should be done in plain language that anybody can understand. Reports are becoming more and more complicated, and so we need to be working in some of our education into these reports. And so that, like I said, non-geneticists um, can also understand this information. So. To kind of summarize, there's lots of challenges for the implementation of an institutional personalized genomic medicine program. We're always working on um, ways to deliver accurate and timely genomic test results in a cost-effective, high-throughput manner, um, and also to cover those clinically relevant genes. Many of you probably are aware that exome sequencing, although we say we sequence the whole exome, we're not actually capturing the whole exome at this time. And so one of the areas that counselors can really help is to help identify these clinical areas of clinical relevance that have lower coverage and that the need to be uh, better covered by our capture methods so that we have more information to give our patients. We also have to work on how to analyze and store clinical genomic data. This has been a 
this is a big hurdle for a lot of people who are trying to implement these programs, as is the variant database for data interpretation. And what do all these thousands of variants mean that we see in a given person? There's a strong need to integrate genetic results, whether it's the family history through to any genomic testing, into the electronic medical record. And there's also a need to improve insurance reimbursement for genomic testing and genetic counseling so that we can start to make personalized medicine a reality. And like I've talked about throughout this presentation, we really have to be able to educate everybody on the healthcare team as well as our patients if we want this to be an adopted uh, program in the care of our patients. So a lot of times we're asked, what's next? And I think it's really difficult to predict because 10 years ago we did not envision the clinical exome sequencing arriving into the clinical arena so quickly. But some of the things that we're talking about often are haplotype analysis of these uh, of genome and exome sequencing, the integration of multiple ohms like the microbiome and the transcriptome along with genome and exomes the integration of genetics into the electronic medical record, and then there's always the debate about newborn sequencing versus newborn screening. I think, although it's difficult to predict, what we do know is that genetics and medicine will continue to evolve and discoveries will continue to be made. And so we must challenge ourselves with continuing to discover, improve, and engage others in personalized genomic medicine and doing this as part of a team. And finally, we know it's going to be fun. It's been a lot of fun to date, so I think this will only continue to improve. So with that, I need to thank my team. Here you're seeing uh, some our, the team of the Iowa Institute of Human Genetics, and we have a large team of bioinformaticians, clinicians, uh, researchers, lab scientists, as well as um, genetic counselors and administrative support. And with that, I will take any questions. So the first question is how safe to use this um, as risk depends on us? So I'm assuming this is for any kind of personalized genomic medicine. I would say at this point it is safe um, to use as long as there's the evidence-based. And so really keeping this evidence-based um, in what you return to patients. And you do have to be cautious with that. Um, let me see the other questions. So what, sorry, I'm just trying to read these. What are the what are the percentages of possibilities of genetic variation in type which would affect the working of a drug? So this really is dependent on the gene and the drug. And so here at Iowa, we have a committee that's working on analyzing that data and what are the various, um, you know, what is the level of evidence that we can predict for these um, types of pharmacogenomic testing and then gradually releasing these and developing new tests as we go. Um, the variation types are often single nucleotide variants, but we also can see copy number variants. Actually, for uh, in CYP2D6, for the metabolism of codeine, hydrocodone, and tramadol, copy number variation plays a, a large role in that. And so we have to be able to do this, um, copy be able to detect copy number as well as single nucleotide variants. Let's see, um, the next one how to deal with, address, or resolve the concern over too much identity information being revealed. Um, I'm trying to, so this question, um, I think, you know, this is a huge issue right now. And one of the things at Iowa when we created our exome test was because there aren't those protections for life insurance discrimination, long-term care, or disability insurance discrimination, um, we did not incorporate secondary findings. We do have, we're in the process actually of writing a protocol, so if patients wish to learn secondary findings, they could do this on a research basis, which would not be part of their electronic medical record, um, because that is an issue at right now. I think the other way to deal with and address this is to really have your consent process in place. And so, um, in that process, we allow our patients to select what they learn and what ultimately goes back into their medical record. Um, but I think this is an active area for debate as well. Um, 
So how well and establishes the genomics technology in the general healthcare already? Are HMOs accepting of this and drugs treatment for coverage? And is there wide acceptance from medical practitioners, general medical practitioners? I think it really depends on the practice. There's some areas where it's definitely genomics is more integrated in um, than other specialties. I think we see a lot of immunologists who are very comfortable with genetics. Cardiology, we're seeing more. In oncology, we're seeing more. There's always um, going to be early adapters, but I think you know we're not at a point where every patient this is being used for every patient. HMOs and insurance companies being accepting of the drugs and treatment coverage. This really depends on the insurance company. It's really a state and really also at a state level for Medicaid and Medicare. Some are covering it, some aren't. It really depends on the exact gene and drug being tested. Here at the University of Iowa, actually, um, we're self-insured at our hospitals and clinics here. And so the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics has decided that pharmacogenomics testing is um, very important to the care of their patients. And so for anyone with UI uh, Choice Healthcare um, who's insured by the hospital, basically, they will be covering pharma the pharmacogenomics testing. So this is... Um, but I would say that that's also because of a large education campaign that has been happening over the last two years as well. And so the, the administrative officials who make these decisions really understand why this is important. Um, that's expensive. How can costs be brought down in the future? I'm assuming this is in regards to the exome testing. Um, the exome testing is expensive. Um, our costs are actually some of the least expensive in the country. Um, and so we're working on always bringing those down. Um, and right now the biggest cost is in the analysis as well as the storage of data. So we've limited how long we're storing certain data files for to help decrease those costs. And I think um, as both the informatics technologies as well as the wet bench continue to improve, we'll, we'll see this price decrease. Um, and let's see. Um, pick one more. We have a lot of questions here. Um, do you have programs to educate payers so that they understand the medical necessity explained by the provider and patient for reimbursement? The answer to this is yes. Actually, um, we stumbled into this. We were actively seeking um, to educate our payers here in the state of Iowa so that they would understand the need for reimbursement. And in doing so, um, we've actually been contacted by several payers as, who have been looking for answers for genomics. And so they've contacted us through our Ask the Expert feature. And so this is something we're working on as well, is going and presenting to them and educating them in several different ways um, so that they understand the need for this uh, reimbursement. And... Can private individuals use these services? And if so, has the safety of personal genome information safeguarded? So all of our tests we've developed, we've developed them so that uh, a health care provider has to order them. Uh, we're not doing this for healthy individuals, um, the exome sequencing, I should say, but a health care provider has to order it, the tests. And that's so that it, the health care provider can put the results in the context of the patient's history and medical history and help the patient really understand what those mean. So we are, uh, right now, a private individual cannot order a test for themselves. And so I think with that, I will uh, wrap up and feel free to email me any additional questions you may have. Thank you. <laughs>